Good afternoon, members of the Dartmouth community and friends. My name is Andrew Samwick, and I have the honor of serving as the chair of the Department of Economics here at Dartmouth. It's my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the department to this spring's lecture on inequality, discrimination, and opportunity. I'd like to extend a special welcome to the students in our Principles of Economics classes this term who are just beginning their study of the discipline. This lecture series grew out of the Economic Department's commitment to racial justice articulated in June 2020. The primary purpose of our events is to deepen Dartmouth students' understanding of the role of inequality, discrimination, and opportunity in society, and how economics can increase our understanding of these phenomena and inform policy responses. Our event is co-sponsored today with the Nelson A. Rockefeller Center, the Sadie Alexander Association, and the Schoolhouse Anti-Racism Experience. We are one year to the day from our inaugural lecture conducted via Zoom when we hosted Professor Rucker Johnson of Berkeley to discuss his work on school integration. Last fall, we gathered in person to host Professor Nina Banks of Bucknell who shared the lessons learned from her research on Sadie Alexander, the first African American to earn a PhD in economics. Tonight, we are excited to hear from Professor Trevon Logan of The Ohio State University as he discusses the sins of economic history, focusing on enslavement, Jim Crow segregation, and the civil rights movement, and equally, the ways that traditional economic methods have fallen short in our profession's understanding of these periods of economic history. I would now like to turn the microphone over uh, to Matibi Penkakana, who will introduce our speaker and moderate our event. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Matibi Benkikana, senior and um, economics major. Um, I'm a co-founder of the Sadie Alexander Association, um, which aims to empower black and minority students here at Dartmouth. Um, our goal is to play a role in like, fostering greater um, diversity in the field of economics. So today, I have the great pleasure of introducing um, our guest, Professor Trevon Logan. Now based at The Ohio State University, Professor, Professor Trevon Logan majored in economics at the University of Wisconsin before going to UC Berkeley where he received a dual master's degree in demography and economics followed by his PhD. Professor Tr Trevon Logan was the youngest ever president of the National Economic Asso Association and is an amazing example of how we at Dartmouth can apply our economics and economic, econometric analysis to sort of what we find personally interesting <coughs> and relevant. His, wi his wide-ranging research topics include racial inequality, returns to education, sociology, public health, dowries in South Asia, gender and masculinity, and even college football. Alongside his research, Professor Logan has also led several great initiatives to increase awareness of racial inequality and promote diversity here in, in the field of <coughs> economics. So even despite my oppositions to Ohio State as a University of Michigan fan, I've personally been really inspired by the work of Professor Logan and very excited to see his lecture today. So without further ado, why don't we give a warm Dartmouth welcome to Professor Logan. Thank you, and, and thank you for that very kind um, introduction. And I, I, as uh, now Buckeye, I'll return the favor and say, um, that I really appreciate that, and we look forward to seeing you in November. Um, I want to thank uh, all of you uh, for coming uh, tonight as I, I talk about the sins of economic history. And I, I first want to um, sort of give an idea about what I'm going to talk about tonight and how I'm going to talk about it. So um, you've had very distinguished speakers, and I know uh, Rucker and, and Nina quite well, and so this is not going to be um, typically sort of grand old man ramblings. I really want to think through some issues that I've been thinking about as a practitioner in the field as I really turn to the topic of racial inequality um, in my research, but also thinking more broadly about what it means and the implications of our work. So I'm hoping to do something that, in the end, is planting a seed that will be more generative uh, for a larger discussion that I think needs to happen in the profession, in the academy, but also largely in society as well. <clears throat> 
So we should start by defining terms. I'm talking about the sins of economic history, and by that I'm talking about sins in the relationship to racial inequality and our understanding of racial inequality. So what do I mean by economic history? So a very straightforward definition that I use of economic history when I teach economic history is that it's the application of economic theory measurement um, and analysis to historical events. Now, relative to other types of economists, and of course, economic history is an applied field, what an economic historian should bring to the table is a knowledge of history, particularly a knowledge of context and a knowledge of institutions and a command of the narrative record that really gets you to understand what people were thinking about and what they were feeling as they were making decisions as you're describing them in an economic narrative. And so economic history, therefore, has to be motivated by questions that are economic and questions that are historical, and also questions that are just simply important for us to understand where we are today. Identification and sort of causal inference, uh, which currently is the, the coin of the realm in the profession, um, is certainly of secondary importance, in my opinion, to excellent economic history. And that'll be important when we're talking about uh, these sort of venues as I'll get to them. So what do I mean by sin? I don't mean mortal error. That means you, know, you end up uh, spending eternity with the devil, right? I mean sin in the archery sense uh, to miss the mark, right? And so the flaw does not need to be intentional, um, but the impact of the flaw can actually be devastating. It can actually obscure us um, from considering things that are particularly important. But it's important that I'm talking about sin, but that does not require that people are evil or that we have villains in this sort of uh, drama that I'm going to describe here, right? So these misses, these sort of uh, errors that are made, for example, are not errors of commission. They're largely errors of omission, but they still are missing the mark of what we should be doing as social scientists and as economic historians in particular. And finally, the most difficult definition is what do I mean by sort of race and racial inequality? So we can think about race in a variety of ways, and certainly in your classes, you're thinking about race and learning about race in a number of different aspects. You can think about race as a social category. That's probably the safest way that certainly economists think about them as a variable in a data set, and you think about differences as they pertain to that sort of variable. And certainly people talk about race as a social construction, and then they don't understand, well, what does it mean for it to be socially constructed and how does it change? But we know a good response to race is that it's a social construction. We can also think about race as a physical value, something that is biological in its definition. And we can also think about race as a political construction, something that allows us to sort of distribute goods, services across different groups of people. And race can also be something that is experienced, right? An individual experience and also a group or communal experience, or therefore a social experience. So all of these things blend together, but I want to emphasize race in a particular way, that I'm viewing race as a political construction, which inherently makes it an economic construction because politics exist to distribute resources and power in our society. So any political construction, by definition, is also an economic construction. But it's also an experiential state, and it varies in its material consequences, in its psychological impact over the life course, but also over time more generally. So someone's experience of race in the United States in their life course today will be very different than someone's experience of the same racial categorization, say, 100 years ago or 50 years ago. Right? So race is not something that is static. It is inherently dynamic. But also its political consequences change over time, which of course then have material consequences on people's lives. So I'm thinking about these sins of economic history, and I'm thinking about them in three venues. In American enslavement, in American racial segregation, and in discrimination in public accommodations. And some features of my research will show up on each of these, but they're not really the primary uh, focus of import for this conversation. So let's turn to the first venue, which is the economics of American slavery. American enslavement and the economics of American enslavement is probably still the largest literature in economic uh, history. It's where the discipline truly sort of cut itself off <laughs> from the humanistic uh, traditions, made itself a subdiscipline of economics, increased its methodological rigor, and really set it on the stage to where it is today, which is actually a well-integrated subfield of economics. And economic historians really moved the focus of the economics of enslavement 
to new heights. Um, the narrative historians have followed suit. You wouldn't have a history of capitalism if you didn't have the economic history of enslavement beginning in the 1950s. You wouldn't, for example, talk about racial capitalism if economic historians had not discovered the profitability of enslavement in the antebellum era. You wouldn't talk about, say, reparations or other forms of abuse and forms of uh, extractive capitalism if it was not for the case that economic historians overturned a previous well-accepted narrative out of the Phillips School, which was that enslavement was unprofitable, unproductive, and was purely consumption for those who were in the master class in the antebellum era. So there's a lot that is owed to our debates about capitalism and the nature of capitalism and its relationship to racial formation and its relationship to extraction that really is lied with the work of economic historians. So there's a problem though, right? There's a tendency, even for those who want to critique the economic historians, to see economic incentives and enslavement as sort of all encompassing. And so this actually probably is a feature more likely to be held among non-economic historians than among economic historians today. And at the heart of this is this sort of tension between Racial capitalism, as it's now termed, and you have a number of uh, really prominent historians who are speaking about this, and then capitalism in, in a pure sense that we might define, say, in a dictionary, and a really big discussion of whether there is a distinction between the two. So certainly growing in the humanistic fields and history is a belief that all capitalism is essentially um, racial and gendered in its construction. That is, would certainly be an open question among economic historians. But let's go to some particular issues that sort of bear this out. The first are punishments and productivity, okay? Punishments and productivity. This really is about the way that the cash crop in the antebellum South was produced and how it was produced in its relationship to punishment, its relationship to the later development of factory discipline and other forms of disciplinary capitalism designed to increase the profits for firm owners. There's a belief, and probably Fogel and Engerman started this belief, that you can think of a large-scale plantation for cotton in, say, the 1840s or 1850s as a very small factory that is producing an extraordinary amount of output and that has well-disciplined workers working in it. If you marry that, say, to Caitlin Rosenthal's work in accounting for slavery and thinking about the ways that capitalist uh, enslavers are <coughs> counting, for example, productivity at the individual level, meriting out punishments at the individual level, thinking about the present discounted value of their enslaved people that they own, all of these, of course, have forerunners to the way that we account for and manage profit in uh, capitalist systems today. But the issue of productivity can be quite obscured, right? You can think about whippings on a plantation, right? We know whippings existed. We know whippings uh, occurred. And there are two sort of opposing views of punishments on plantations. One view holds that whippings are relatively infrequent and that they were much less effective than positive incentives. The second, coming from the history of capitalism, views whippings as being used to punish unproductive pickers, to ratchet a system, and to enforce a regime of physical punishment when quotas were not met, and even more, to raise quotas to even higher levels to encourage additional output production. But note that in both cases, whippings are related, right, either negatively or positively, to enslaved economic productivity, and therefore they're related to profit, okay? So the first case of this, of thinking of uh, enslavement and whippings being relatively infrequent in enslavement comes from Vogel and Angerman in Time on the Cross. Now, despite a lot of discussion in the narrative history about whippings as punishment, the quantitative evidence for whippings comes from literally one plantation and only one plantation, the Bennett Barrow Plantation in Louisiana. And analyzing that data, which records the whippings per slave over a two-year period, Fogel and Engerman say the following. The record shows that over the course of two years, a total of 160 whippings were administered, an average of 0.7 whippings per slave per year. 
about half the hands were not whipped at all during the period. And being good quantitative economic historians, they want to show you a figure to establish that fact. Right? That the majority, or nearly the majority, of the enslaved people on the Bennett Barrel Plantation in the 1840 to 1841 year, calendar years were very infrequently whipped. There are numerous errors in this figure and in this statement by Fogel and Engerman. And we can start with the very first one, right? Fogel and Engerman use the wrong denominator. If we're talking about whippings being related to productivity, I have to remove all of the people who are not involved in cotton picking from the denominator. Right? Or else I'm talking about whipping people for reasons that would be unrelated to productivity. I can't whip someone for not picking cotton when I've told them not to pick cotton, right? When you actually remove those people from the calculation, things turn really bad for Fogel and Engerman, but they're going to get worse. So from Gutman in 1975, he knows exactly who is picking on the plantation because those are recorded in the same plantation records. Right? So when you look only among those who are actually involved in cotton cultivation, you have a very different record of whippings you'll see that very few people are not whipped at all, right? In terms of the number of men not being whipped, less than 20%, and the number of uh, total people not being whipped on the plantation. So something is going on, right? Because we know that of those engaged in cotton production, more than 75% were whipped. Now, this is still 0.7, but it's not now 0.7 whippings per year, it's 0.7 your likelihood of being uh, uh, whipped if you were someone involved in cotton cultivation. And note, we have only the diary records from the Bennett Barrow Plantation itself. We only have the whippings that Barrow decided to record in the diary. Right? By definition, there could be other whippings and other forms of punishment that are not recorded in the diary at all. So this has to be the most conservative estimate of the extent of punishment on that plantation. So we know that punishments, in fact, were very common on plantations. That still does not get to the question of whether they're related to productivity. If they are related to productivity, then it's got to be the case that the most productive pickers will be whipped the least, if Fogel and Engerman are correct. And also in the case that even if the new historians of capitalism are correct, that the least productive whippers have to be whipped the most because they would need the most punishment in order to produce output. So the key for this in thinking about enslavement as an industry is being consumed by its capitalist orientation, right? That everything that you're doing on this plantation is involved in the production of this crop, this output that is fueling this operation. Okay? You can also decompose the people on the plantation into the most productive and to the least productive cotton pickers. And what will you find? The most productive whip, whipper, uh, pickers on this plantation commit the most disorderly acts, and they are punished more than the least productive cotton pickers on the very same plantation. So there is something odd about decomposing these numbers and stratifying them by the individual productivity that we can also estimate from the same records. So there's an alternative explanation here about this relationship between whippings and productivity. If the most productive uh, pickers are the most punished, then it has to be the case that there is some either inverse relationship where the most productive people are the most punished, which certainly is against this idea about there being positive incentives, or it's gotta be the case that the least productive whippers were actually punished the least, which makes no sense if you want to do this to encourage their actual effort and exertion. So it's not a ratcheting system, nor is it a positive incentive system. It could simply be a system of abuse, and it could serve a very different purpose, right? It could serve to make people under your psychological control, under your emotional control, and most certainly under your social control. Leaving that issue aside, right, it also, thinking about this relationship between, say, whippings and productivity, obviates a discussion of other forms of punishment that we know were practiced in the plantation economy. There was sexual assault. 
Bennett Barrow, in particular, builds a jail on his own plantation because he has such a serious problem with his enslaved people running away. They literally are jailed for the entire weekend because if they are not, they would actually leave. He chains people publicly. He practices public humiliation of making men, for example, walk around in women's clothes on that plantation. They are bitten by dogs. They are caned. They are waterlogged. They are sawed. Sawed is taking the jagged edge of a saw and beating it against someone's hand. It doesn't permanently damage your hand because that would actually be capital destruction. But it's enough to cause serious injury and, of course, intimidation. Notice that when we're talking about this relationship between whipping and productivity, that none of these other punishments, although all of them are mentioned in that same diary, are discussed in the literature as being part of productivity. So how should we then think about these punishments, which we know are practiced on the same plantation that we're using to make a case that either whippings were frequent or whippings were infrequent? Whippings are all that are in the technology space. So the focus on whippings understates the degree of punishments and the options that enslavers had at their disposal. Okay? Some additional punishments that were meted out in plantations that the people are forced to watch abuse. They're having the names of their children, for example, changed. They could be forced to perform on demand, anything from dancing to singing to any other sort of act. They could be made to procreate, which creates a unique space of sexual self that I'll speak of in just a moment. And think of the whippings that we know from American narrative history. This is the whipping of old Barney. You know? So if you know the autobiography of Frederick Douglass, you know this is the moment that he said, I'm going to get out of enslavement. Old Barney did not pick cotton. Right? Old Barney managed horses. And his owner was a sadist who beat him. Right? In the literature, we also know that Uncle Tom dies from a whipping by Simon the Great. Uncle Tom is not whipped because he doesn't pick enough cotton that day. He's whipping for actually uh, trying to help someone attempt to escape. And that whipping kills him. Right? So even in the literature, we don't see this relationship between punishment and productivity. We see it as the outgrowth of the enslavement system itself. So Cydia Hartman talks about this exercise of power as being inseparable from its display because domination depended upon demonstrations of the slaveholders' domination and the captives' abasement. And so scenes of subjection from the humanities captures so much more realistically what is happening on plantations than the economic historians have been able to. These beatings and these punishments and the range of punishments available is a political demonstration of power that is tied to the economic system. If we go forward to Spillers, she talks about this pansexual potential for any enslaved person to be violated by someone in the master class. And then what we have is a total vulnerability of enslaved people that reorients the definition that typically relies on other axes, for example, such as sexual assault, which we tend to think about operating on a gender axis. And so these sorts of acts actually on plantations occur without any gender specificity for a victim or assailant. So they become a new class of distinction and a new way of reorienting who is abused and who is the abuser. Because for the sadist, punishment of others is consumption, right? So whether one is sadistic or not, what can happen is the social system can routinize forms of punishment and cultural practice to reinforce political and economic hierarchies, and ultimately social hierarchies. So this focus on thinking of punishments as part of the production system is really missing the mark that it actually should be a part of, some of the social life that is occurring in the plantation economy. Another issue that comes in enslavement is this issue between cotton and, and prices, right? And this is much more of an economic issue, so I'm gonna start talking about supply and demand now, right? So we know that the supply of cotton was substantially above trend in the late antebellum era, and we know this because there were two factors that were going on. There was the westward movement, say, between 1840 and 1860, certainly to the Mississippi River and beyond, 
And there was also a simultaneous move of existing land in the antebellum so uh, South to be moved to cotton cultivation, right? States were significantly increasing their per capita and aggregate amounts of cotton produced as they moved more land to cotton production. And they were moving more land to cotton production by responding to the increased demand for cotton coming from international uh, um, uh, uh, demand, particularly from Great Britain. Right? We know in the economic history record that when the Civil War broke out, and the ships ceased to depart from, say, Charleston or New Orleans with uh, cotton, that the mills in England had to be retooled to spin Egyptian and Indian cotton. Right? They had to actually change their technology because the United States supplied as much as 90% of the world's cotton production up to that point. Right? So their supply was cut off by a war. And this is one of the reasons why the South believed that they'd be recognized by their European partners because of their power in their own economic system. Now, the overwork of enslaved people increased the cotton supply, right? And lowers cotton prices, right? If the cotton is produced, people are producing more than they would freely do, right? And remember, these prices are set nationally because this is a commodity, right? Cotton absolutely is a commodity. So what are the reasons why we get all of this excess production from these cotton plantations? Now, Vogel and Ingerman identified four of these, which still stand in the record as being particularly important. There was a division of labor within the gangs, and we see these economies of scale most often in plantations with more than 10 enslaved people on them, because you can subdivide the task of both planting and of harvesting into smaller units. And you can speed up production, therefore, by disentangling the task. You have an extensive division of labor within those gangs for the production and harvesting of cotton. An extensive use of female labor, particularly pregnant women. And there were crop mixes that intensively used the land. Even with that, it's important to understand that we think of the antebellum South as this place of just nothing but un, um, you know, un, unkept sort of agricultural production. They had more land in inventory than in the northern United States. Right? They were not yet at their production possibility frontier for what they could do in an enslaved system. But let's return to the, uh, the work of pregnant women. Right? This is still probably one of the most uh, disturbing tables that I'll ever see as an economic historian. What Fogel and Eggerman are doing is looking at births among enslaved women in the plantation economy and looking at their work effort before and after giving birth. Okay? Immediately before giving birth, right, literally the week, of, uh, the week before giving birth, over three quarters of impregnated uh, slave women are still working in the field. Right, producing around 100 pounds of cotton per woman per day. Right? That is an intense amount of physical activity for people that we know were chronically malnourished in the antebellum era. But look at how quickly they return to production. In a month to seven weeks, 80% of them are back in the fields and working and picking 100 pounds of cotton per day. So we know this explains why the children of enslaved women as a population were the smallest group of babies born that we have seen in any human population to this point. You cannot work and extend what we would now estimate to be 4,500 to 5,000 calories of energy a day as an, a pregnant woman until the week of birth and then immediately after birth go back into the fields and, and work. And all of this production was fueling increases in supply that were met by increased demand. So by the time you get to 1859, when cotton prices are reaching their peak, they're literally four times as high as they were in, say, 1835. So we know that these are people who would not want to work as hard as they were working. So what is the counterfactual here? The counterfactual is that cotton yields would have been lower, right, had we not had an extensive uh, amount of people who were forced to labor in, in the fields. But I'm going to just assume, because I'm an economist, the demand would have been as strong in Britain because the world market for textiles was taking off at a growing clip at this time. And cotton prices, and therefore the profits, 
would have been greater than they were in enslavement, right? Since enslavement led to overproduction, right? And you can see this from a very simple supply and demand diagram, right? So say this is cotton production in say uh, 1859, but then we have to think, well, what would cotton production have been without enslavement in 1859? And of course, it's going to be a move and a shift of the supply curve, which would give us higher prices and lower quantity, right? And so why does this sort of matter, right? Why am I thinking about sort of this counterfactual of a bunch of small farms producing lower output but having really high prices? Because the discussion of reparations has focused on modern racial wealth inequality, right? And if you listen to authors like Sandy Darity talk about this, the idea is that eliminating the racial wealth gap would be compensation for enslavement, discrimination, exclusionary federal policies, the capture of black wealth from the founding of the nation down to the present. The problem with that is what I just told you was that the wealth in the enslavement system is understated, right? They left profits on the table. So equating uh, wealth, any racial wealth inequality or eliminating wealth any, racial wealth inequality may understate the reparations due to the descendants of enslaved Americans as harms from enslavement could exceed the racial wealth gap itself, right? And the one thing I'm missing in that diagram that I showed you is I need to know the slope of that demand curve, right? I really, really need to know the slope of that demand curve because the elasticity of demand for American enslaved produced goods needs to be estimated to see and measure really that counterfactual. Right? So how are, what are we missing in this, this first venue, right? Not accounting for punishments in slavery, which were not related to productivity, leads to an understatement of the harms of enslavement. Not accounting for the health effects of enslavement underestimates its impact and its intergenerational impact. And not accounting for lower cotton supply understates the counterfactual of the potential profits that could have been made by small, potentially black farmers and the foregone profits for enslavers. So these sins are neglecting the racial formations inherent in American enslavement and that part of these punishments are about establishing a racial regime. Forgetting that racial oppression itself may be an end into itself, right, for political purposes. And that confining enslavement as an economic institution sort of obviates the needs to discuss the externalities from the economic to the social and the political and vice versa. We can't only think about the economics of enslavement, we must think simultaneously about the politics of enslavement and the sociology of enslavement as well. So let's move to the second venue, which is segregation. And segregation is ultimately a tool of systemic racial inequality. It's a technology that allows you to do something. When populations are racially segregated, you, for example, can divide and distribute public goods over different aspects of the population. You can center, for example, harmful environmental products and policies in one area and limit the spillovers to other populations if you have racial segregation. The problem with this and with this story is that we have a story that centers on cities, that looks at segregation as an urban phenomenon. So we have a narrative that tells us that segregation is about American cities, that it peaks in the post-war era, and it's primarily about the desire to have racially segregated public goods. So if I take from Cutler, Glazer, and Bigder in their um, celebrated study of segregation, these are two of the common indices of segregation, dissimilarity and isolation, which are actually measures of income dispersion, but have been used to, discuss, uh, to uh, analyze racial dispersion. Segregation peaks in 1970, and we see that segregation is highest in the cities of the Northeast and lower, actually, in larger cities of the South. But segregation is a story primarily related to the Great Migration, if you believe this narrative, where people move from places like Alabama to Detroit, which becomes a hyper-segregated city 
with a very segregated and isolated African-American urban core surrounded by a white suburban community. And this narrative tells that story. Now, what that narrative also does is it implicitly assumes that rural segregation was constant and that rural segregation is unimportant in explaining dimensions of inequality. It downplays the role, of course, of rural politics in the segregation process. But even more important, there is no theory that I've read about segregation that says it only operates in urban areas. <coughs> right? so people can be segregated in rural areas as well. <coughs> so let's look at the United States historically before we have this influx of, of, of African Americans leaving the South. The majority of African Americans in the decades after the Civil War are still living in the former states of the Confederacy. If you look at these segregation indices, you'll find that it is, in fact, the places outside of the South that appear to be more segregated. This is the index of dissimilarity. And similarly, if you look at the index of isolation, again, the levels look a little bit lower, but once again, the South is not an outlier in terms of being a segregated place. So several years ago, John Parman and I began to consider a way of measuring segregation that could bring these rural areas in in a consistent way. One of the reasons we measure segregation for urban areas alone is because it's really hard to measure segregation in rural areas. The cool thing about cities is that cities are cut up in lots of different ways. They have lots of different neighborhoods. And you can look at just the racial proportions in those neighborhoods, aggregate them up to the city area, and tell me how segregated the city is. Rural areas kind of don't have a neighborhood. But <coughs> rural areas all have neighbors. So we used the digitized census. I mean, used every census from 1880 to uh, 1940 to look at the races of household neighbors. So what we're able to do in a new measure of segregation, which works just as effectively in rural areas as in uh, urban areas, is to look at whether or not your next door neighbor is of the same race. Now, at this time historically, up to 1940, there were very, very few interracial households. So the race of the household head was typically the race of everyone in that household. But this is actually an example from the street that John Parman lives on in Virginia today, which is now an exclusively white street. So at this time, there was an opposite race household on the same street in which he lives today. So something has changed over time, and we'll get to that. This measure of segregation paints a very different picture of where segregation was concentrated in the United States. It was not a feature of the uh, North. It actually was a feature of the South. The reason being, <coughs> black and white people are living in the same communities, but they are not neighbors with one another. Being someone's neighbor is a way of establishing some level of social equality. What we know happens in rural areas and in urban areas in the South is there was a back of the house pattern where African Americans lived behind white households. If you go to the Garden District, for example, in New Orleans, you'll see that sort of pattern where there are houses behind the houses on the main streets where, of course, servants and others who are subservient to those in the main houses live. So exploiting these enumeration and, and enumeration practices in the census tells us that these traditional measures of segregation really don't paint an accurate story or picture of segregation. So using the percent black for a county, which is the typical way the economic historians think about dealing with segregation in rural areas, doesn't tell us a whole lot. So this are all of the counties in the United States and using the 1880 measure of segregation. And we do see that there is a slight increase in segregation as the percent of the county uh, increases in its percent black. But the other thing that you'll notice in this figure is that the relationship is homoscedastic, right? And what that means is that the variance around the line that I would draw here is basically the same, right? So knowing that a place is 50% black, I would still have the same error bounds on the level of segregation in that community. But we can go even further, right? Because these are counties, counties are really big. But what about the census enumeration districts themselves, right? When I look at just the census enumeration districts, I get something that looks like, you know, sort of segregation meets Jackson Pollock, right? It's just a complete mess, right? Because if my enumeration district is 50% black, I don't know if I'm living in, for, for example, something that would look like Chicago today, or if I'm living in a completely integrated community. 
So knowing the percent black at a really small granular level still does not tell me very much about the level of segregation in those locations. And this isn't just a phenomenon of the places outside of the South. Right? Even in the South in the enumeration districts, knowing the percent black in the population doesn't tell me as much about its level of segregation. So not only does rural segregation tell us something that cannot be elicited in sort of county percent black, but there's variation in rural segregation that we can exploit and look at phenomena that is racial in orientation, but that also occurred in rural areas. So in some work with Lisa Cook and John Parman, we looked at the relationship between our measure of segregation and lynching. And what we found was that areas that had more segregation and that were more segregated had more lynchings in the traditionally used uh, American lynching database going from 1883 uh, to 1930. Our estimates tell us that a one standard deviation increase in the segregation index results in an additional lynching in a county over that time period. And more importantly, they explain interracial lynchings, but they do not explain, segregation does not have a strong factor in explaining intra-racial lynchings. So that racial segregation tells us something about interracial contact that does not apply to interracial contact. And it's important to understand that rural segregation also changed over time. So you recall that figure that I showed you, which showed this peak in 1970 and then this departure after this point, Increasing segregation is not about the Great Migration and the creation of a black urban core in America's major cities, particularly in the Northeast and the Midwest. Increasing segregation is a national story about sorting by race increasing over time in American history. Irrespective of the region of the country that you are in, segregation measured by neighbors doubles basically between 1880 and 1940. So by the time the United States is engaged in the Second World War, we are as a nation a hyper-segregated society, urban and rural, north and south, east and west. And you can see this in the level of change in segregation. It's not concentrated to one particular part of the country or another as it changes over time. So there is something else that we can also say about cities, however, right? If I turn to cities, the segregation story is actually really nuanced because the simple population shares, I can now break down into a much more expansive space, right? And so I always use New York as an example because it has five boroughs and you can break things out by the boroughs and they're well-known boroughs that people uh, sort of know. So this is my map of New York, right? And I can look at the segregation index by borough in 1880 and I can look at the segregation index by borough in 1940. And what you'll see is that well, Manhattan and the Bronx become very, very segregated, right? increasingly segregated over time. Right? But what's going on and what's happening behind that segregation? The percentage of households, of white households, with a black neighbor declines over time right? as New York becomes uh, and has a in significant increase in its black population. Its black population increases by more than threefold over this time period. But look at what happens for the likelihood of black households having a white neighbor. Right? When African Americans are less than 5% of the population of Manhattan, they were three times more likely to have a white neighbor than in 1880 as they were in 1940. So it's not just this increase in population, even within the boroughs of New York itself, segregation is occurring, right? and we can measure it in this new way. So the sins here are ignoring the ways that residential sorting changed in rural areas of the United States. And that forces us to move away from this urban story that's concentrated on the Great Migration to think about residential sorting more generally. And these correlates of segregation and broad measures of segregation have import for rural and urban areas and tell us something that we did not know about American racial history. So political factors are related to the national increase in segregation. And understanding that political story is critical in explaining our contemporary outcomes of segregation and the process of hypersegregation, and in fact, retrenchment from that hypersegregation, say in 1970. And so limiting our analysis to a social process 
because it's easy to measure using traditional measures of segregation, leaves the very full story untold. It's one of these instances in which we've had measurement before theory, and now that we have new measurement, we must have new theories about the role of segregation, the measurement of segregation, and its implications over time. So moving now to the very last uh, venue, which is public accommodations discrimination. And this is something that we don't talk a lot about in economic history or in economics more generally. We have a very, very, very thick literature in economics that I wouldn't even begin to summarize, which looks at the impact of non-discrimination policy in employment and that looks at non-discrimination policy and integration policies in education. But the largest venue for protest in the civil rights movement was about public accommodations. In fact, it's public accommodations that give us separation <coughs> and legal segregation, right? Plessy versus Ferguson establishes the practice of separate but equal, and that's about a streetcar. When you move to the Montgomery bus boycott in 1955, that is about a city bus, it's a public accommodation. The Greensboro sit-ins in the early 1960s are about a public accommodation, right? A county uh, a store and seating people at a lunch counter. And this level of segregation was absolutely entrenched in American society in the past. Right? The separation and the legal separation of the races was not simply a Southern phenomenon. Du Bois himself wrote about the fact that even in New York City, he could not find hotel accommodations for himself as an African American, and one who, of course, was very well healed at the time. Right? And this colors every aspect of life because everything is separated. So we don't talk a lot about one of the key areas of social protest and one of the key areas of significant policy revision in the civil rights movement, which is about the ban on racial discrimination and public accommodations. And so segregation and public accommodations creates a significant information problem for those who face discrimination because some places could be open to you and some places could not be open to you. So Mia Bay, in uh, the book that just won the Bancroft Prize, talks about this and notes a national survey in the early 1950s which finds that over 90% of the hotels surveyed would not house an African American as a guest. So finding a hotel at this time was an incredibly difficult task because you did not know who would actually be able to see you. And state laws banning racial discrimination and public accommodations don't appear primarily until after the Second World War. So to solve this problem, African Americans really produced historically something that probably would be analogous to, say, Yelp or some other sort of online crowdsourcing, which was the Green Books. And the Green Books, this has no relationship to, that, to the movie because the movie doesn't talk about the Green Books at all, but these are the actual Green Books, right? And what the Green Books are are directory of uh, places of public accommodation that importantly would treat African Americans in equal social standing to white Americans. This is critical because discrimination in public accommodations could occur at the extensive margin, but also at the intensive margin. So it was very rare, for example, for a gas station not to serve an African American and let them pump gas at the station but it would be very uncommon for a gas station to let an African American, for example, use the restroom, right? So that is an, uh, an aspect of intensive margin discrimination. If you have a restaurant, for example, that serves African Americans through a to-go order but does not let them eat inside, that's intensive margin discrimination. So it's not always about banning people, but it is about second class and the establishment of second class citizenship. So in digitizing these green book records with uh, Lisa Cook, Maggie, uh, um, Maggie Jones and David Rose, we have found increases in those businesses over time. And in fact, by business type, these businesses uh, are mostly eating and drinking establishments and formal lodging uh, and informal lodging. Informal lodging, because of the presence of such extensive discrimination in the hotel industry, led to there being a strong market, for example, for people simply opening up their homes for African American travelers. And when you put them on a map, these are the places in the green books, and, and the larger circles mean more establishments. Whereas an African-American, you could find businesses that would treat you on equal standing. 
And so we said, think about the geography of these places, because where were these businesses located sort of within cities, and what does that mean, right? The businesses weren't only located in within cities, and so there's a separate project looking at the rural areas and bringing them back in. But how does this match to the racial sorting in urban areas? So I showed you New York before, and this is New York now, which I'm going to overlay with two different additional pieces. The Homeowners Loan Corporation redlining maps, which of course have the red areas marked in red, and all those little red dots are the green book businesses, which we've geocoded by their longitude and latitude and match them exactly to their location. And what you'll notice is that the green book businesses, the places of public accommodations, the places that would treat African Americans equally, are almost always located in the red line communities of cities. Whether we're talking about Philadelphia or whether we're talking about Boston, I could only find one place in New Hampshire and that's Manchester and only had one green book establishment, but <laughs> even in uh, Manchester, New Hampshire. So that these green book locations appear primarily in two areas of a city. They appear in the red line communities and they also appear in central business districts. So that second line, that gray line, are actually ungraded areas because they're not residential areas at all. So you either had access in a red line community or you had access in uh, a, um, a, a central business district. So how can we think about this relationship between non-discriminatory businesses and the political climate about non-discrimination. Important to note that today, if the Supreme Court ruled that Title II of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which is not enforced under the Equal Protections Clause of the 14th Amendment, it is actually enforced by Congress under the Commerce Clause of the Constitution. It is inherently about economic activity. Five states would immediately revert to Jim Crow and three of those states would actually revert to Jim Crow by law because they have never repealed their requirement, their legal discriminatory requirements on public accommodations. Right? By law, you'd be violating the law in some of these states by actually having a place of non-discrimination. So we use the legal coding of Polly Murray, who recorded laws of race and color in her 1950 volume, to look at this relationship. So you see there's a negative relationship between state laws that enforce or establish discrimination and racial discrimination. And in fact, a positive relationship with states that had laws that banned discrimination in particular areas of life. So there's a legal and economic relationship between access to public accommodations and discrimination. And firm owners consistently noted that integrated policies would drive their white uh, customers to competitors. They were very worried about integration and consumer discrimination. And empirical evidence in the historical narrative really do point to strong discriminatory preferences for white consumers to not have us to go to establishments that treated African Americans equal to them, right? And why is this important economically? It's important because if consumer discrimination is really, really strong, there is not a market solution to end that discrimination. So when you talk about markets of sort of taste-based discrimination, say in the labor market, what happens to the firm that practices discrimination is they are less profitable than the firm that doesn't practice discrimination and they're driven out of business. That doesn't work in a consumer discrimination model because consumers are willing to pay for discrimination and in fact the profit maximizing firm should in fact please them and they would actually have, well, have higher profits. So we aren't paying attention to this e the stable equilibrium discrimination when we don't talk about consumer discrimination, particularly as it pertains to uh, public accommodations. And so the labor market discrimination is about firms, but the public accommodations discrimination I've really come to see is something, again, that is political and about citizenship. So in a capitalist system such as ours, the ability to freely consume, to do business as you choose, is fundamental to participating fully in the political economy. Being segregated in public accommodations is establishing you politically and economically as a second class citizen. And in a capitalist system, those two come together and that is why they were so mutually reinforcing in American history. So thinking through the, the, the economics of public accommodations discrimination allows us to view these debates about the teaching of American history about voting and voting restrictions in a very new light because fundamentally they are ultimately about citizenship. And so we are still fundamentally in a fight about citizenship, 
and about racialized citizenship if we think about race as a political construction. So economic history has illuminated our understanding of the racial past, but only through a very limited prism, right? We're missing much larger issues that would help us to focus on why economic history can help us understand the present, right? History is always actually historiographically, I believe, about what is occurring today. The reason we have a history of capitalism today is because we're worried about inequality today. We're not worried about inequality in 1890, we're worried about inequality today. We have a new history of race today because we're worried about racial relations today, not racial relations 300 years ago. So the, our historical focus is about our contemporary uh, um, issues and, and, and contest. So the question of citizenship actually goes back to the point about how subjection takes place and how it's related to political objectives. So neglecting the politics of race leaves us unable to describe the economics of race and its inherent political economy. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Logan. Um, so just, just quickly, I know it's uh, 6.30 and some people may have places to go, so um, we're gonna do a short q and if, if that's okay, but if you need to uh, go somewhere, you have another obligation, please um, just feel free to, to go if you have to. I didn't want this to like happen as, a, <laughs> as people asking questions. Did you get the mic? So we'll definitely have like a short one. Yeah, I got it. It's muted here. So. We can we can do it here. Oh, it's not working. Should we ask the guy for that? Just come on. So the mics are muted in the system. Yeah, it's here. <laughs> So this is good too. This can is good. everyone hear me? Is this so? I can, okay, great. So um, just for the questions, um, if you could just raise your hand, um, ask your question, keep it short. Um, Shukuka, Shukuka will come to you and give you the mic. Oh, is that one worked? Yeah. Hi, Professor. So in your first and third examples, you've mentioned about the relationship between um, racial inequality and like the exploitative nature of capitalism. And I was wondering, um, in your views, like for future change and future policy, do you think that we need like structural overhaul, like moving towards a more socialist system? Or do you think continuing with like the capitalist system is still possible to have like future change? Yeah, that, that's a very good uh, question, um, and one I've thought about a lot, I think one of the, the issues is I don't know if we've never ever actually tried capitalism, right? Um, if you go back to sort of the original components, we've sort of not talked about that endowment issue, right, in, in any sort of capitalist system, and that's really important. So if we had some sort of equalization of endowments, maybe a capitalist system would work. Um, but I think we've sort of not discussed that, and that's actually fundamental to the way that we think about the system sort of operating over time. And so I would not necessarily um, uh, approach this as being critical of capitalism, but understanding that the way that we theorize capitalism is very far away from how we've actually um, practiced capitalism historically. <laughs> 
thank you, Professor, for your talk. I, I was really interested about the topic of like reparations and how we can't just view um, sort of the racial wealth gap as the way to like address that. And obviously, like quant how my, kind of my question centers, centers on how could we quantify the effects of segregation and discrimination in public accommodations into a potential sort of reparations bill and sort of following on from that how like in what in your view how best could we like di distribute those kinds of funds to maximize their impact yeah so those are there's a two questions in there I'll, I'll try to be uh, very brief there are some attempts and so I have a paper in review of black political economy um, with, with several co-authors Thomas Kramer uh, Sandy Darity talking about how, ways of valuing sort of this trying to value this one of the big things about reparations it depends on where you stop are you thinking about this being enslavement and stopping in 1865 are you thinking about this um, continuing through to the present and the racial wealth gap um, Sandy Darity and, and Christian Mullen have a new paper in the Journal of Economic Perspectives which makes the case for equalizing the racial wealth gap and, and there are a lot of proponents for it it's easy to do, we can estimate it. And then the other question that I sort of pushed on, which is your second part, which is how do we distribute it? It's not an income transfer, right? If we're trying to actually bring about racial wealth equality, we can't just have a large income transfer because all that's going to do is in fact exacerbate the racial wealth gap, right? Because the income is gonna to return to the owners of capital who right now are not uh, pr predominantly um, black Americans. So you would need to actually have wealth transfers. Now, historically, the federal government did this very well by simply giving people things like land, right? That was one of the re main ways in which the federal government has encouraged and um, racially uh, encouraged racial wealth disparities is by having policies that created and um, uh, subsidize the creation of white wealth at, at, to the detriment of black wealth. So today you can think about several different things. Um, I've uh, thought about um, investment accounts, I've thought about tax protected invested accounts, I've thought about um, property uh, bonds or loans that parents could transfer to their children, for example, for the purchase of uh, property, for real estate, for other sorts of um, assets that uh, appreciate over time. So there are several different mechanisms that could be involved in that, but you have to think about this now as a wealth transfer. So whatever dollar value you attach to it, you'd have to have some sort of mechanism that would be attached to wealth. You also have to think very seriously about the macroeconomic implications of this, right? So even if you were going to do an income transfer, um, that would lead to just inflation out of control, right? For lots, of, for lots of very simple reasons, right? So you can't think about this in sort of just the abstract of what the dollar value is. You would have to really be very serious and design this as, as a very sophisticated policy. So just, just quickly, um, could we go to the back of the room uh, for a question? Um. Uh, thank you, Professor Logan, for your uh, presentation. So kind of building on the discussion of like policies for wealth redistribution, um, given especially today's like very uh, polarized political environment and people's almost like censorship of our past and injustices of the government in the past, um, how can such a policy be made more politically feasible so that instead of just talking about it, we actually see some change? That's a really good question. Um, uh, probably my response uh, is, that I don't think um, that we should water down our, our goal because the current political climate would tell us that it, that it is, doesn't look like it's something that would be feasible. If I told you in 1837 that we're going to end enslavement in the United States, you'd probably laugh me out of the room, right? But it happened, right? And a lot of people who were saying that in 1837 didn't, leave to see, didn't live to see it happen. So if we stay to that as a goal, perhaps we will achieve it. Um, people who said in uh, 1927 that black people would be voting in the state of Mississippi were also laughed out of the room and then that also happened as well. So these things that may appear to be impossible in the current political climate can be made possible, but not if we actually say something else because we think it's going to be expedient. Thank you, Professor. Um, I thought it was really interesting how you talked about the racial wealth gap today and I was specifically interested in um, like the way that the capital gains tax today and the preferential treatment of it like adds to that racial uh, wealth gap. Um, a lot of people have called for the elimination of the step up in basis provision. A lot of people have said presidential candidates have uh, proposed um, eliminating or like starting to tax capital gains on death and then also like an accrual basis. What's your take on how capital gains can be taxed to further like wealth equality racially? Yeah, I think one of the, the larger issues, sort of stepping back on that, because I don't, um, 
have a firm grasp of the empirics of that to give a firm answer of saying we should do this and we shouldn't do that. But we had a much simpler tax system when we taxed very few people, right? If you really look at the early IRS when we first started the income tax, it didn't apply to the vast majority of, of Americans. And as it has applied to more Americans, it's been unequally distributed. So you, this is where you get these great figures where the tax rates actually on people in middle income are much higher than the tax rates of people who are very wealthy. And if you look at our tax code, it's gone from being something that was I think, right under 20 pages at the very beginning of, of uh, the income tax to now it's you know several books and it's easily manipulated, but it's become a political animal as well. And so that's one of the reasons why we see this current, uh, the current design of individual policies. If we went to a simpler tax system or perhaps even a wealth tax system, that probably would maybe be a good thing. I would have to see the sort of counterfactuals what would be raised. But I think minimizing the degree to which you create loopholes is probably going to be a much greater policy, right? What, what we see is that it's a ton of tax avoidance because there are avenues of tax avoidance, right? And I think that's one of the biggest implications of the current tax system is it does work for those who can appropriately manipulate it, but who can appropriately manipulate it are people who can afford lawyers and accountants and others and also can work with lobbyists, right, to design policy where they can protect wealth, for example, they can shield income, they can, in fact, you know, count losses double or triple or other sorts of manipulations, and they also can face a lower rate of being audited, right? So, you know, you, you would much rather file as a multi-million income earning individual with a very complicated tax um, uh, filing than someone who's earning their earned income tax cr credit in terms of your likelihood for being audited by the IRS. Thank you, Professor, for your talk. Um, I definitely appreciated your insight on how like, the current tax system is one that does um, tend to favor and people that already have that existing capital. And you also mentioned the um, issue of like reparations and kind of transfers and wealth transfers. But I also kind of was curious um, as to kind of the part where you pointed out that there has been like increasing kind of segregation even within boroughs or within districts. So I was wondering, is there a way to kind of quantify like the wealth impacts associated with um, more racially segregated districts? And is that also something that in addition to like um, reparations and wealth transfers should also be done and like um, that there should be more efforts to like um, purposely like re like further integrate communities? Yeah, you could do this through, the, there are a couple of studies that, that do this. Um, uh, Sood, who is at uh, university, PhD student at the University of Minnesota has looked at res racially restrictive covenants. Um, those were ruled unconstitutional in 1948, so at the really the start of American suburbanization. And so you find that those places that are built in, with restrictive covenants at that time today are more racially homogeneous and actually have higher property values than adjoining subdivisions that were built immediately afterwards that didn't have racially restrictive covenants. So there's a way that these policies become locked in over time and sort of capitalized into property values. How to break that is, um, I think, very difficult. But what you could think about doing is, as a reparations program, for example, um, tax abating, uh, those who would be eligible for reparations, for example. You could also think about having there to be tax advantages in terms of their purchase of, of properties or the subsidization of their uh, acquisition of, of property. Um, one of the things if you start doing that, of course, is you need to ensure, and just with an in, as with an income transfer, if you give a lot of people these sort of incentives to go and purchase, say, property, it's going to increase the value of the property for people who are already owners, right? So you have to have some institutional structures that allow other people not to take advantage of that, or else you would once again exacerbate the existing wealth inequality. So when you really think about it, it sounds much easier to do than when you start implementing it because you realize it has to go out into a macro economy that has a lot of these features of racial wealth inequality sort of built into them, right? And then how to undo it is actually quite complicated because if you just give people money, you think the solution is to give people money, but that's not going to actually solve the problem. It's going to make it worse. You should just let people buy houses. It's not going to do anything. It's gonna increase demand and it's of course gonna drive up the value of the homes that people already own who are of course own them partially due to these racially discriminatory practices. So solving the problem is in fact really going to require us to think very deeply about the ways in which this racial inequality is embedded into the economic structure of, of our macro economy, not just existing sort of in cities of segregation or, or these other sorts of things, but really embedded in very fundamental ways. Um, hi, thank you so much for coming. Um, I was thinking about the segregation part and I found that in one of your research, uh, you found that black 
individuals who lived in more segregated areas lived longer compared to those who did it. Um, so what are you thinking about, um, in your view, what social and economic changes needs to be done in order to decrease um, this gap? Yeah, so as a paper with, with, with John, we were looking at sort of the, these differences in segregation and how they actually operate. So one of the things that he, he's found in some subsequent work is that the way that cities are segregated and how segregated they are influence another way of public investment. So if a city had high levels of segregation, they were more likely to start a public uh, water system, right, a water sanitation system. And the reason they started one is because they could exclude African Americans from it. Right? So Werner Trotsky's work, Water, Race, and Disease, talks about this in rural areas. When Southern whites realized that they could not just clean up their own water, they had to clean up everyone's water, you see a huge conversion in black, white uh, um, mort mortality due to waterborne diseases. And so the same thing in these sort of cities is that they have these huge gaps in mortality because they continue, they're growing out a water sanitation system, but it's not making the black residents any healthier. So in the integrated cities, which start them later, they actually have a more accelerated convergence in, in health. In rural areas, segregation can have some protection effects against particular types of disease, right? So I was just talking about water, but now think about sort of airborne diseases. Think about we're coming from the pandemic of being in COVID, right? So we know that there can be racial concentrations of particular sorts of respiratory infections and other sorts of infections and disease. And so if you're racially isolated from other people, you simply won't be infected by the diseases that, that impact them. And so that's one of the ways in which segregation was actually protective of African Americans in some rural areas. But the design of segregation, when people were thinking about this historically, and Du Bois talks about this as well, was to always let the sick people and the poor people be in one part of the city so that I would not be sick and that I would not be poor, right? So remember, segregation is a technology that allows you to do this. In some instances, it actually has some protective effects for those who are segregated, but the intention of it is always to have a class of people who would be insulated from the disease that you can concentrate in other areas. Uh, first of all, thank you for the lecture. It was great. Um, you talked a bit about how in talks of reparations, they don't take into account how the unsavory conditions that slaves would go through, how could you see that being quantified um, in talks of reparations? And could you see that potentially being, um, uh, that like quantification being given, uh, given out to descendants of enslaved people? I think it, some of these punishments would be very difficult to quantify, right? We don't have an, a complete accounting of all of those sorts of things. Um, I think it's important though to note that thinking that they're equalized or thinking about the profits due to uh, uh, cotton production, say, you know, in the antebellum era, right, are all going to be, that's the way that we capitalize what, what's owed to the descendants of American slavery is going to be an underestimate because, you know, implicit in that, as I was arguing, is some idea that the, the entire production process tells us we get this output, and now I can just use the output, right, because that's my proxy for everything that goes into it. But there's a whole lot of things missing there that are about subjugation and humiliation. I don't think all of these things can be monetized, right? And so then this turns you know, back to sort of a more humanistic social science point. And we just have to sort of accept that, right? Like There are just going to be some things that we're not going to be made whole for. And that's the difficult part of, of history or even in thinking about reparations. There are going to be some things that are not going to make us whole. And there are going to be some parts of this that there is not any um, monetary value that we can attach to some of these things. Thank you so much. Um, I was wondering when you were able to look at the segregation on like the street and the, I guess like neighbor to neighbor level, like what changes did you see in the provision of the public goods? So the big example I would give you is, is the water example that we see in, in cities, for example. So it's, you have to lay these out over several different things. And so for water systems, you need them to match the geography. So we know where people are in enumeration districts, and we know when the water is actually turned on in these cities. And so you have a set of studies that can tell you that. It's more difficult for other forms of public infrastructure that are laid out. One thing that we do know is we can look at where these cities are, and you can even take the HOLC maps that I was looking at, and you can look to see, for example, where people are purposefully moved from, right? So many of these green book businesses that I was talking about that are located in these redlined areas don't exist anymore because the redlined communities were the most likely places for there to be interstate road construction, right? Because that was the cheapest land. It was in um, these highly segregated communities that were heavily African-American. 
And you destroy the whole community when you build an interstate through it. It's not just because you displace people, but you move them out, and now they don't have the capacity to actually solicit your business, right? So we can't just think about sort of redlining and the construction of the interstate as about destroying residential communities and destroying home values and those sorts of things. It also destroyed African-American business districts, and it also destroyed businesses that were offering equal public accommodations to African-American patrons. So um, maybe we'll just take two more questions now. Um, I guess Stephanie has one, but the next, okay, we'll take that question over there and I think we'll give Professor Logan a bit of a break after. <laughs> Um, so answer the, the, the second question first. You know, the, the economic argument about slavery at the time, and Gavin Wright has a great piece in the Journal of Economic Perspectives about this, was that you certainly shouldn't want to, uh, the pro-slavery economic argument was that um, slavery was making the United States rich, and why would you want to stop this source of, this source of jobs? Um, if you've seen the movie Don't Look Up, like slavery is the meteor. It's like all, it's providing the jobs to the people in the South and this is what we want to do. This is our, this is our economic future, right? And we wouldn't depart from it. So that argument certainly, the moral argument was of course the abolition argument and that ended up being the one that won the day. Um, but to your, your first question, it really depends on the venue, right? And so we talk about the civil rights movement overall, and the civil rights movement encompassed a lot of things. It encompassed bans on discrimination in employment. It also encompassed bans on discrimination in public accommodations. And there were different competing forces about how that would actually operate, right? And then undergirding that is, of course, the desegregation of public schools, right, which also is another avenue of this. And so it's very important to understand the dimensions upon which those things were operating. Non-discrimination in employment had a very different venue and certainly had a lot of opposition but not as much politically as school desegregation and public accommodations uh, um, uh, uh, desegregation. And part of that is actually due to gender, right? There was serious concern, right? One reason why the federal government resegregates under the Wilson administration, and a lot of people don't realize this, the federal government was actually completely integrated. And a lot of the talk of segregation that we talk about is actually a resegregation, right? There was desegregation, and then there was actually segregation, and then later on, another area of, of desegregation. So when Woodrow Wilson resegregated the federal government and, and federal employment, it was because his wife was really concerned that black and white people were working together, and in particular, that black men were working with white women. And she thought that was absolutely socially unacceptable, certainly from her, um, thinking from her, her time of being a Virginian, and it was unacceptable, and it had to absolutely end, and that's why he resegregated uh, employment, right? So there were always these concerns that were about something else. It was not simply concerns that you're going to make me, right, for example, hire an African American. It was how is the team going to cooperate with all of these people involved, right? And so that's, again, sort of a lie to this idea about consumer discrimination that we saw and sort of resistance to public accommodations discrimination, right? Firms weren't talking about, I just don't want to serve black customers, of course, and they wouldn't want to say that because politically, right, it would be um, very unpopular. But they said, I'm a business owner. People come and solicit my business. I'm, you know, I I'm just beholden to the market, and my market of consumers is telling me that I need to be discriminatory. And that's where a point of resistance was. But I think the reason there was so much resistance there is that's an element of social equality, right? So there's a reason why you have protest around that, and it's a reason why you have significant pushback about it, right? Why would you have a Southern Manifesto about children six, seven years old going to school? Because it says something socially to people, right? And so then they want to use the political process uh, to undo those, those, uh, those gains. Um, thank you very much for your lecture, Professor. Um, I wanted to quickly touch on the process of wealth creation and retention in terms of reparations. And I wanted to discuss future and very modern trends in terms of labor economics, automation. There's been a lot of regional wealth destruction and I'm wondering how can we make reparation and wealth redistribution forward-seeking and adaptive and responsive to these pressures? 
Yeah, I think that the, um, one of the things that, that people uh, talk about, and there's, there's some research about, um, which doesn't match up with the empirical record, is that you know what you really want to do is you want to encourage African American business formation or things like that, right? That would get you sort of on the technological frontier. But in fact, you know, controlling for lack of wealth, African Americans are actually more entrepreneurial than other uh, racial groups. They start more businesses than anyone else. Unfortunately, or the, more than 95% of African American businesses have one employee, right? And so when you have a significant wealth constraint, you're not able actually to receive the capital that you need to grow your business and to grow your business more fully, right? So this is really a problem of, of, of wealth, right? When we think of people who are sort of uh, captains of industry today, right? So Jeff Bezos and all these other sorts of people had relatively wealthy parents, right? So if you look at the start of Amazon, it doesn't start because he's just hard scrapping and doing his thing. He has access to capital, right, via his parents, right, to help him start and sustain this business, right? The same thing that other people who are now some of the wealthiest people in the world had access to, to begin and start their businesses. Because we know just sort of intergenerationally that wealth begets wealth. And so I think one of the solutions to this is that we've never tried this before of just having this sort of wealth in this particular community that could actually spur this entrepreneurial spirit, which is there and we certainly see in the data, but which is currently inhibited by lack of, of wealth. Okay, so maybe we can end here and um, give another round of applause to Professor Logan. Thank you. Yes, my thanks as well, Professor Logan, and thanks to the great audience, great questions. Thank you very much. <laughs>